We're back here on uh, Business Portal. This is your host, Dotti Casino, and our guest for this, epi for this uh, episode, which is on the topic of constitutional reform, is the founder of Get Real Philippines and Correct Movement, none other than Orion Perez Dumdum. So, Orion, we were talking about what happened in India. They nationalized the industries, and you were saying that the Hindu growth rate mm -hmm. wasn't so spectacular. So how, did they go to some kind of reform? They did, they did. All right. What basically happened was in 1991, mm. okay, um, then Prime Minister Narasimha Rao, who actually took over from Rajiv Gandhi, who, who was killed, you know, yes. he was, there was this explosion, you know, right. and he killed okay. him. Um, when that happened, Narasimha Rao realized when he looked at the, uh, the budget, you know, the, the the financial situation mm, the in India, the fiscal situation in India, he saw how bad things were. He saw that they were actually at the verge of a major financial collapse, a major, they were, they were on the verge of bankruptcy, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he was getting calls from the IMF and the World Bank saying that, look, we're not going to be able to lend you any more money unless you get your act together. Okay. And so he decided, well, there was really nothing else they could do. He, he, he basically got... Um, Today, he's already the Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh, mm -hmm. to be the Finance Minister of India. Mm -hmm. And both of them actually decided, let's study what the other large country in the world is doing. Okay. And that other large country in the world is China. Okay. So when the Indian, these two Indian leaders, together with their entourage, went over to China, mm. they, they actually witnessed a major difference. They saw how nice the, uh, the airports there were compared to what they had. They saw how nice the, uh, the roads were compared to what they had. And they started asking all these questions of the, of the leaders. What are you doing right? And, and how do you get to pay for all this? Okay. And the leaders in China basically said, well, we, what we did was we allowed foreign companies to come in and create jobs for our people. And that's why you know, we're able to pay for all this because the taxes... This was during the time of uh, Deng Xiaoping. Yes, this is this right after. This was after, after Mao, Mao Zedong. Yes, yes. So when he opened the doors, he brought in foreign investments. So he had two systems: the capitalism and communism. Yes. Yeah, so what okay. happened really was okay. uh, the communist system by Mao, the Maoist system, which the CPP, NPA, and NDF are fighting for, hmm. was repudiated okay. by uh, Deng Xiaoping. By Deng Xiaoping. Yeah. Right. Deng, Xia Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping. Yeah. Deng Xiaoping. Uh huh. Um, he. He basically changed, revolutionized um, the thought process in China because before it was all communism. You know, right. everyone's equal yeah. to each according to ability, to, to each according to need, mm. from each according to ability. But he changed all that. Mm. He said, fu guang rong, which means to be rich is glorious. So he, he, he basically started introducing the concept of of prosperity, working for your own prosperity, rather than this whole equality concept. But that was something that the Mao Zedong was trying to suppress. He was trying to suppress that. Suppress because there was the, the wealth was only concentrated to the few. Exactly, but that's the problem also because okay. because uh, Mao Zedong's uh, Great Leap Forward was a major disaster. So millions of Chinese died because of the flawed communist policies. Mm -hmm. You know that. What did they die of? Up. Hunger. They died of, uh, of hunger. There was a famine, basically. Okay. Um, he had a lot of these misguided economic policies. And, uh, and because people were being paid not based on the output that they did, no one was really motivated to, uh, to, grow, um, to grow crops, all right. uh, raise, raise poultry or whatever. Okay. So people didn't, didn't what, raise... What, what made Tong Xiaoping, Tong Xiaoping, yeah. Tong Xiaoping decide to open up? Well, back in... After Mao, Mao Zedong died mm -hmm. in the seventies, in the seventies, he was the one who took over. And when he took over, he he realized that all the things that Mao, well, many of the things that Mao did, were wrong. And he says, "What do I need to do to fix it?" Mm -hmm. So he did all these state visits. He visited other countries. He mm -hmm. he went over to uh, Singapore and Malaysia, and he saw how they had actually progressed compared to them. Mm -hmm. Especially Singapore. Singapore was one of the main countries that he saw, which yeah. really, really got so much better than they were before. Uh -huh. And uh, he re when he when he spoke with uh, Lee Kuan Yew, yeah. he found out that Lee Kuan Yew's strategy was to invite foreign investors, right, right. allow 100% ownership. Okay. 
and use that as a means to create jobs. So is China now allowing 100% ownership? Yes, they, own, they allow that. They allow 100% ownership. Mm -hmm. They started off right after the visit. I would think okay. it was, must have been 1977 or 1978. Okay. And it was, I think, in 1979 when, uh, 78 or 79, mm -hmm. something like that, where um, Deng Xiaoping decided that he wanted to learn how they were doing it in Singapore. Mm -hmm. So we set up Shenzhen. What is okay? Shenzhen, where we Shenzhen, Shenzhen, yeah. which is right next to Hong Kong. Okay, this he, is the nearest province, right? Yes. What he did was he uh, he started, he up, small. started up this small uh, pilot project Shenzhen. of um, allowing <coughs> foreign companies, mm -hmm. mostly from Hong Kong, many, mm -hmm. many of these Hong Kong textile, whatever, yeah, right, right. to come. You know, please set up your shops here. We're cheaper yeah. instead of Hong Kong. You guys are so crowded. It's so expensive. Why don't you come here across the border? where probably you're just going to spend one-tenth of what you're paying this for labor. This was before labor. the 1997 turnover? That was long, long before that. That, okay. was in the, that was in 1978 or 79. Ah, all right. So that was the start of Shenzhen. Okay. And it was like a special economic zone. It was like, essentially what happened in China was they had this, um, they had barbed wire fences mm -hmm. where the, the, the PLA, the uh, People's um, Liberation Army, Army, set up this whole perimeter here uh -huh. in, in Shenzhen. It used to be a small, sleepy village. Okay. Yeah. They, they created this area, yeah. and they started ma building roads. And they used that as the, the infrastructure that would bring in all these factories okay. to set up shop. And when they did, people went over there, and it became a showcase mm. of Zhifu Guangrong, of what is, what is called uh, to become rich is glorious. Mm. Shenzhen is one of the richest uh, cities in China today. Right. And it became the model for all the rest of... Uh, the coastal cities in, in China and to the develop. Rest like Guangzhou. Yeah, Guangzhou and uh, 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 Shanghai. Shanghai has been Beijing. Shanghai has been the financial district center even before. Yes, that's the, right. The it the was fall, before. before the fall. Of course, it lost it when uh, when the communists took over. Right, right. Many of the Shanghainese families actually emigrated. They went abroad. Many of them went to Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Hong many Kong. of them went to Hong Kong. In Singapore, yeah. In Singapore or wherever right. else. Yeah, uh, yeah. The yeah. U.S. You know, so. There was this ma massive brain drain, mm -hmm. but uh, later on, you know, Deng Xiaoping actually decided, hey, let's invite all these people back in, okay. you know, later on to set up companies. So see, we're seeing the miracle that happened in, 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 Ch in, in China, India did the same. India did the same. So they started this regimen of changing their rules. Mm. Lucky for India, it was not in the constitution. So in the constitution of India does not say, uh, we are going to uh, restrict, you know, 60, 40, or 100 percent has to be owned by Indians. Yeah. They didn't put that there in their constitution. Instead, instead they even said their trade must be free. That's, that's in their constitution. Mm -hmm. But in any case, they reversed whatever old legislation that existed that restricted foreign investors from, com from coming in, as well as other restrictions that prevented the uh, expansion in size of local companies. You okay. see, the thing about India before was they, they believed a bit in this whole uh, Gandhian, Gandhian minimalist mm -hmm. uh, ethos. And when I say Gandhian minimalist, we know that Mohandas, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, mm -hmm. was himself uh, somebody who advocated you know, vill cottage industries, right. village level subsistence and mm -hmm. all that. You know, it was uh, homespun clothing, no to uh, mass-produced items and things like that. Okay. It was all about small-scale businesses and okay. all that. Okay. So that became, that kind of became the paradigm in India. Okay. That's why they started saying, they, they said before, no large companies. If you want to become a large company, you're going to have to set up a new company. Okay. Now let's move in forward to the concept of the constitution. Mm -hmm. We've done already much on the economy. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about modern constitution. You're saying that the Indian constitution is silent you're ab silent about, about restrictions so your movement is saying you're not encouraging 100 percent all you're saying is take out that restriction and just be silent about it and if need be proceed with legislation mm -hmm. so what other reforms does your group look, look looking forward to I mean the type of government are we looking into yeah well okay so the first one is economic liberalization yeah. the second one is Trust for an evolutionary transformation to uh, region-based decentralization. Okay, what do you mean by that? 
So many people would sometimes call it federalism. All right. Okay. Um, I would call it first an evolved transition to decentral, to region-based de decentralization. So not not quick. Not quick. Not instantaneous. Not uh, okay. big bang. You know. So it has to be, it has to be one which is evolving because we're coming from a central, you know, centralized unitary. But we system. had we had decentralized under the local government code. But they're not based on regions. So okay. they don't have the same. They don't have the same type of economies of scale that larger regions would have. When you say regions, you're talking about the 17 regions of the country. Yes, that's right. All okay. right. And what kind of form of government are we looking into? This type of regions, federalism is what you're saying. Yeah, federalism is is uh -huh. one of the different forms. There's there's actually there is unitary, and then there is federal. So mm -hmm. there is basically a continuum. In between, you have these intermediate forms. So you have quasi quasi-federalism and then you have semi-federalism. It mm -hmm. depends really. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's about um, the taxation. How, m how much taxes go to the national government first yeah. before be be, you know, being remitted being back? Remitted back okay. Or do they actually use most of their money and then just remit a small percentage uh, to the national government? Yeah, so, right. so little things like that. It, 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 you, you adjust that in between. That's, that's, where, that's how far in between just you Just like what's happening it. in Lanao. You've got Lanao yes. Lake that's feeding up water through that Christina Falls, mm -hmm. and it generates so much power all over the islands of Mindanao. But in terms of return in developing the, the, the two provinces that owns that has that boundary of Lanao Lake, they do not benefit from That's it. quite unfortunate, mm -hmm. yeah. That's, yeah. That's very un unfortunate. Right, right. So, I mean, it would, it would be nice if what so you have... That, yeah, yeah, that would, that would be, uh, what do you say, equal in terms of distribution. Yes, that's right. Okay. So, and, and this federalism that you're, is it federalism? Is that, is that the right term that you're going um, to use? I'm calling, some people call it ev ev uh, evolving federalism. Okay. I call it evolving region-based decentralization. Mm -hmm. uh, only because I don't want people to say that it's necessarily federalism. Federalism yeah. is what we aim for, mm -hmm. but um, right after we change the constitution, it doesn't necessarily mean we're automatically okay. federalist. Uh, Sometimes when you hear changing the constitution, we're talking about from a unicameral to a, from a bicameral to unicameral. What is the stance? Well, our stance is yeah. my personally, mm -hmm. I have nothing against bicameral per se. Okay. Um, however, I think that a bicameral uh, legislature should reflect constituencies. Okay. So well. that means um, we have constituencies for the districts in uh, in the lower okay. house. Yeah. Right. If you have a, an upper house, you should also have constituencies. Uh, Currently, the, the upper house, the Senate, does not have constituencies. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, if you're not going to have any constituencies for the upper house, don't have an upper house. I see. Let's talk more about the, the, the division of this and the, the, the form of government that you live. We have to pause for a break. You're tuning in here on the Biz Portal. This is uh, your host, Toti Casino, with our guest is Orion Perez Dumdum. And our topic for this episode is constitutional reform. Do stay tuned for the concluding uh, segment of this portion. <laughs>